Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the Bible study of today. We thank you because you have been faithful in teaching us and revealing your mind to us. And we thank you too because you've given your children faithfulness to come every time to listen to the word, to learn together. I pray, Lord, that everything we learn will be translated into grace, strength, and power that we may be able to live by your supernatural supply in Jesus' name. Amen. That our lives will match the word of God. Amen. That the gap, the distance between us and the world, you bridge that gap. Amen. And make us live closer to the word that we're learning every time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We come back to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, today we're coming back to verse 6 again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do you hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We come to this verse again because we have not exhausted the teaching, the instruction, the revelation we have in the verse of scripture. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. As we look at the tense that Jesus used, it's in the present tense. Not that they did thirst and hunger. Not that they will in the future thirst and hunger. But at this present time, they do thirst and they do hunger. And it says they thirst and hunger after righteousness. And the blessedness of it is that they shall be filled. The Lord is using the feeling or the passion of hunger and thirst because hunger means the feeling that is caused by the need to eat. Thirst is a feeling that is caused by the need to drink. And as these earthly things, food and water, satisfy the body, so the heavenly virtue, the heavenly quality of righteousness satisfies the soul. The food and the drink will not satisfy the soul. Neither will the righteousness by itself satisfy the body. But as hunger is expressive of our thirst or of our desire and passion for something to take in, that means in the same way our soul is passionate, is desirous, is asking, and is seeking for righteousness to be able to fill us. That's why the Lord said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, because they shall be satisfied, they shall be filled, they shall be saturated, they shall be satiated. As we look at Luke chapter 15, verse 17, you'll see what the passion the strong desire, and the inner drive, as well as the feeling of hunger and thirst, what it does to man. Luke chapter 15, verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to eat, have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And then he went to the father. You'll see it was a passion, the desire, the feeling of that hunger that drove him and said, I need to do the right thing. The same way when we have the feeling the desire, the eagerness, the passion 
of the righteousness. Before we can meet the Lord, before we can see the Lord face to face, we we'll say, I'm going to arise. Why would I die in unrighteousness? I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, I need this, I'm passionately seeking after that which my soul needs. In Lamentation chapter 2, the passion of hunger and thirst. And what it drives a man, a woman, or a boy, or a girl to do. In Lamentation chapter 2, verse 18. Their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night, and give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thine eyes cease. Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. If there is hunger and that hunger is not satisfied and the need of that hunger is not met, what it does is eventually we faint. We lose our strength. We lose our physical energy. And it says over here, the children. The young people were fainting for hunger in the top of every street. Therefore, they were told to cry mightily unto the Lord. Lamentation chapter 4 verse 4. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread and no man breaketh it unto them. Again, you see here what hunger does if the hunger is not satisfied. What thirst does in the life of anyone if that thirst, if that hunger is not satisfied. The throat is dry and the throat is so parched or dried that you desire, you must have water to drink. If you don't, if it's not satisfied, then there's going to be a problem. And the Lord is bringing that strong passion, strong desire. The Lord is bringing that to the spiritual side. That's why it says, spiritually, blessed are they which do thirst and hunger, or hunger and thirst, after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Why do we ask for food? Because there's absence of food. Why are we asking for water to drink? Because there is an absence of water. When there is not enough water in the system, there's not enough food in the system, we're passionately, eagerly, thirsting after that water, hungry after that food. Why are we asking for righteousness? Why are we thirsty? Why are we hungry? After righteousness, because there is absence of righteousness. If there is substance of righteousness in our heart, and we know that it's only through this righteousness we can see the Lord face to face. It makes us to punch after him, desire him, and reach out after him so that that righteousness can satisfy, fill us, and satiate us. That's why it says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Have you noticed? That unrighteousness and righteousness cannot coexist in the same heart. Light and darkness cannot coexist in the same place. Salt water and bitter water cannot coexist in the same fountain. And so, if there is unrighteousness in the heart, unrighteousness in the soul, unrighteousness in the life, then we are passionately eagerly wanting that righteousness to be given unto us look at second corinthians chapter 6 in second corinthians chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 14 be ye not unequally yoked together with some believers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness 
as light and darkness cannot stay in the same place. So righteousness and unrighteousness cannot stay, cannot abide, cannot coexist in the same place. In James chapter 3, James chapter 3, verse 11, does a fountain send forth at the same place with water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear only berries? Either a vine fig, so can no fountain, but yield salt water and fresh. That means then, if there is some righteousness, then there is no righteousness. If there is righteousness, then there is no unrighteousness. If there is light, then there cannot be darkness in that same place. If there is darkness there, then there cannot be light there. Why are we passionately, eagerly asking after righteousness? Because there's unrighteousness in one form or the other. And that unrighteousness we know. If anyone dies in that unrighteousness, he will not be able to see the face of the Lord. And because of that, that's why we're saying, Oh Lord, there's one thing we want before the day of rapture. There's one thing we want before the day of death. And that is righteousness in our soul, righteousness in our spirit. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? As soon as we discover that we are not fit for the kingdom of God yet. And we know there's just one basic thing. One indispensable thing. One important thing that will qualify us to see the face of the Lord. Then we begin to say, oh Lord, give me this righteousness. We're asking, we're seeking, we're knocking for that righteousness because it is that and that alone that will qualify us to see his face on the final day. It says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? By the unrighteous, what does he mean? Who are the unrighteous? It tells us in verse 9, be not deceived, neither fornicators, those who are the unrighteous, not the idolaters, those are the unrighteous, not the idol adulterers, those are the uh, unrighteous, or the effeminate, or the abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. If you look at your life and you find any of these things there, that means there's absence of righteousness. And if there is anything you ought to be seeking, if there's anything you ought to be praying for, if there's anything you ought to passionately seek after, it is this righteousness that will come from the very heart of God to the heart of man. And then the Lord said, blessed will you be when you hunger and when you thirst after that righteousness, because according to the promise of God, you will be filled. It tells us in Romans chapter 1. That unrighteousness actually leads us to the judgment of God. In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 29. Romans 1 verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Again, what are they? Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. You see, when the word of God mentions a word, the word of God makes it very plain and very clear. And you know, there are people that jump and they run and they read the Bible. And it's like, they don't want to be patient to look at the details of what they are reading. When we mention the unrighteous, then they move on to another thing. Who oh, are the unrighteous? It says, the fornicators, the wicked people, the covetous people, and the people that are malicious, they keep malice. They are full of envy. They are murderers. They are debaters. They are argumentators. They are deceivers. Deceit. Malignity whisperers. Those are the people that gossip. Babiters. Haters of God. Despiteful. Proud. Boasters. Inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. That's their too. Without understanding. Covenant breakers. Without natural affection. Implacable. Unmerciful, 
who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The reason why we are passionate or desirous and we are very eager to be able to have this righteousness of God in our soul, in our spirit, in our life, in practice, in everything that we do is so that we will escape the judgment of God. And so as we come and we are studying the Bible together and it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with thirst, with hunger. After the righteousness of God, so that the unrighteousness in our hearts, the unrighteousness in our lives will be cleansed away, will be taken away. And then there will be the righteousness of God within us. Then will there be the assurance that shall Christ come. Or should we die and leave this world any moment? We know that we'll be able to reign with the Lord because he has given us that indispensable quality of life, virtue, that will qualify us to see him on that final day. Romans chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There will be indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. That's the reason why we come before the Lord. And it's not enough just to study. Because you understand, uh, the, it's not the brain that gets saved. It's the soul, it's the spirit, it's the heart. The man that gets saved. And so as we come to the Lord, he wants to fill our soul with righteousness. So that when he comes, we'll be able to go with him. We're moving then from absence of righteousness unto abundance of righteousness. we we'll start with absence of righteousness. There is some righteousness. And because of that absence of righteousness, the judgment of God will come if there is no change. But then we're thirsty and we're hungry after the righteousness of God. And by faith, we get what the Lord has for us. And then it says we're filled with that righteousness. And that feeling of righteousness grants us the blessedness of the people of God. I pray it will be yours and mine in Jesus' name. We divide the message to three parts. Number one, passion for true righteousness. Passion for true righteousness. Number two, praying for true righteousness. Then number three, possessors of true righteousness. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. What do you need from verse 6? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When Jesus said we're thirsty and we're hungry after righteousness, for they, for we shall be filled. We need to understand that Jesus Christ knew that there is true righteousness and there is false righteousness. Look at that same chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, immediately you can see that when Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, he was talking of the right kind of righteousness. Because there's the wrong kind of righteousness. There's false righteousness. And Jesus spoke about it here. And he said, Except your own righteousness shall exceed, shall go beyond, shall be more. Than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise get into the kingdom of God. That means then there is a kind of righteousness that will not qualify a man, a woman, a boy, a girl to get to the kingdom of God. What kind of righteousness is that? False righteousness. How can we describe that? Number one, self righteousness self-righteousness you know uh, what we're talking about here for you to be able to get to heaven is the right kind of righteousness the wrong kind of righteousness 
false righteousness is self-righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6. Isaiah 64 verse 6. But we all, as we are all, as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, are taking us away. Here is one kind of righteousness that will not get us to heaven. Self-righteousness. The one we work up by ourselves. The one we produce by ourselves. The ones we brag about. See what I have done. Like the Pharisee. That's why Jesus said, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes. And the Pharisees shall in no wise get into the kingdom of heaven. So number one, self-righteousness will not make it. Number two, sectarian righteousness. Sectarian righteousness. I need to explain that word to you. Sectarian. That word sectarian is the adjective coming from the word sect. Sect. And the Pharisees were a sect. The Sadducees were a sect. Those Jewish religious people, that was a sect. And the sectarian righteousness is a kind of righteousness you find in a sect. That is a group of people. They have religion that they have raised up. Whatever the name of that religion may be in the language of the Bible, that is a sect. And sectarian righteousness will not get us to heaven. And let me first of all show you in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17, just to search for the word sect. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Well, they claimed to be righteous, but they could be filled with indignation. They could be filled with wrath. They could be filled with anger. But they had sectarian righteousness. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 5. Acts, chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 5. But they arose up. They arose up. Certain of the sect of the Pharisees of the sect of the Pharisees. You see that? Now, when we talk of sect, we're talking about those religious people that do not put Jesus Christ at the center. And they do not understand that Jesus only is the Savior. And that by the blood of Jesus alone, we are cleansed and we are made righteous. Now, those uh, sects, do they claim to be righteous? Of course, yes. There's a kind of righteousness sects have. And they can even say, we're righteous already. But we need to examine that kind of righteousness. If it is sectarian righteousness, it cannot get to heaven. Look at it now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. But I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Except your righteousness shall exceed sectarian righteousness, you will in no wise get into the kingdom. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Sectarian righteousness, that is uh, something that will not get us to heaven. Number three, superficial righteousness. Superficial righteousness. You know there are people, deep down in their heart, there's corruption. There's iniquity. There is evil. But on the surface, they spread, they sprinkle some good works on the surface. And they will say, how are you better than I am? How do you think that you are much better in this, even in the Christian faith? Let's compare our lives. And when you compare, you are comparing just the outward thing, the superficial thing. The thing they sprinkle on their character. It, you cannot see their thoughts. You cannot see the depths of their soul. You cannot see the corruption that is inside them. And the superficial righteousness that they are carrying about, they think that that is what is going to get them to heaven. In, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, verse 28, Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. 
You see, there are people that have so much iniquity within and so much hypocrisy within. But when you examine them superficially on the surface, it looks like they are as righteous as the children of God. But no, it's just superficial. And superficial righteousness is phony, is fake, is a counterfeit, is false. Number four, supposed righteousness. Supposed righteousness. You know, a person just supposed, I think I'm all right. I suppose I'm all right. I think I'm as good as those other people. And I think if they get to heaven, it's only thinking. It's only supposing. Supposed righteousness will not make it. In Proverbs chapter 13, we're reading from verse 12. Proverbs chapter 13. Reading from verse 12. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, there is a generation that appear in their own eyes. But and yet is not washed from their filthiness. They have not been washed, but they suppose they are all right. There's a generation of people. They are upright, they are righteous, they are holy, they are pure in their own eyes. But they have not been washed from their filthiness. They have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb. They have not come to the fountain of the blood of Christ that washes us whiter than snow. And they just suppose, I think I'm all right. Since we may come into the Bible study, it was there any time you deliberately gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or did you just think I've been coming? And I suppose by now I am all right. After all, I've changed my dressing. After all, I'm not going to the house fellowship. After all, I'm doing this and doing that. Have you been washed from your filthiness? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Was there a moment of time? Was there a day in your life you went on your knees and then you confessed your sin before the Lord and you believed that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary? If you have not done that, all the righteousness you think you have, Trying to copy the believers, talking like them, walking like them, praying like them, dressing like them, opening Bible like them, buying a big Bible like them. All that is supposed righteousness. And it is not the real thing. You must be born again. It is that cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. And the assurance in your heart that Christ has made you righteous. That qualifies you to enter the kingdom of heaven. Number five is seasonal righteousness. Seasonal righteousness. What do we mean by that? Is by season. When it's a great healing, then you come to church and then you are happy. And when you are happy, you smile. You have a good attitude. And then you, are, you seem to be doing right when you are happy. But when you are not happy, then everything is negative. Everything is down. And that time, we'll know that you, you know how to use abusive language. We know that you can use insultive action when you are not happy. And when you are happy, uh -huh, you appear righteous. When you are not happy, then it's like there's no righteousness. It's seasonal. It follows the seasons and the mood of your life. But you know the righteousness Christ is talking about? It's righteousness all the time. In the valley on the mountain. In the day, in the night. In the family and outside the family. In the church and in the place of work. Righteousness all the time. But seasonal righteousness cannot make it. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. Isaiah 21, verse 21. How is a faithful city become an hallowed? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it. But now, murderers, there was a season of righteousness. And the time uh, Isaiah the prophet was writing to them, it was a season of unrighteousness. You know there are people like that. And uh, the religious, the Christian religious world will soon start their period of Lent. And it will be a season of righteousness. It will be a season of don't tell lies. It will be a season of don't smoke. It will be a season of don't drink. In the, the time of Lent, they are identified with the sorrow of the Lord Jesus Christ, the passion time when he went to the cross, a season of comport, good comportment, humility, and walking softly, and just doing what they ought to do. And then when the Lenten season is over, then the season of unrighteousness will begin. Are you like that? 
that your own righteousness has seized you. When you are happy, you do well. When you are not happy, you don't do well. When you are happy, you obey the commandments of the Lord. When you are not happy, you don't obey the commandments of the Lord. Seasonal righteousness will not get anyone to heaven. But it is real righteousness. Righteousness that goes on every time. Number six, self-seeking righteousness. Self-seeking righteousness. You know the kind of righteousness that is just seeking to get something from other people? You know, little children do like that. They do that a lot. When little children want to get something from their parents, uh, you know, they're seeking for something. And then they, they do that thing. And it appears good. And if mommy did not notice them, they say, Mommy, you didn't even comment today. See how good I have been. See what I'm doing. Self-seeking righteousness. And there are adults that do that. They are asking for something. They're looking for something. And therefore, they behave right. Deliberately, because they're looking for something, then they begin to project that righteousness. Uh-uh, brother. You didn't even notice that this time now, I've changed. Did you notice that I didn't wear what I used to wear? Did you notice that now I'm comporting myself this way and that way? Self-seeking righteousness, you know, that kind of righteousness will not get to heaven. It's the righteousness whether people see you or not. Whether you're asking for a favor or not. Whether you want anything or not. It is between you and the Lord. It's righteousness built on relationship with the Almighty God. Self-seeking righteousness will not make it. You'll just be like the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, we're looking at verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain, which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. They trusted in themselves, not in the grace of God. They trusted in themselves, not in the presence of Christ living within, but they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. What does that mean, they despised others? What do they do to show that they despised others? Let me show them to you in uh, that is uh, this kind of people. Let me show this kind of people to you in Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. And I'm reading to you there from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 5. Which say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, and a fire that burneth all the day. Self-seeking righteousness. Stand by yourself. I am holy. You have to announce it before you know it. You have to publicize it before you take notice of it. I am holier than thou. And the Lord said, this is the smoke in my nose. And this is fire. And it will burn. Then number seven, sterile righteousness. Sterile, empty, barren, unfruitful, fruitless righteousness. Sterile righteousness. Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58... I'll read verse 2 and then I'll go back to verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. As a nation. Not really that they are doing, doing righteousness but it's like it seems like as a nation that did righteousness. And forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. And take the light in approaching to God. But it was all fruitless. The fruit of repentance, the fruit of righteousness was not there. That's why you go back to verse 1. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a, like a trumpet. And show my people their transgression. And the house of Israel their sins. Yet... Even though they are so sinful, there's no fruit of repentance. And there's no fruit of righteousness. Yet, they seek me daily. They delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take the light in approaching to God. Well then, as we talk about righteousness, 
We're not talking about all this superficial uh, kind of righteousness. We're talking about true righteousness. That's what you'll find in this point one. Passion for true righteousness. Passion for true righteousness. How do you show that you have that passion? How do you reveal? Reveal to God and convince yourself that you have that passion, that desire, that eagerness for this true righteousness. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, you are finding out now from a man that had before, you know, that uh, Paul the Apostle was a Pharisee. He had self-righteousness. Not only that, he had sectarian righteousness, the righteousness of the Pharisees. He had superficial righteousness and supposed righteousness. He had self-seeking righteousness, the sterile kind of righteousness. But now, here is what he had to do to show that he had passion desire, eagerness, and the pursuit of true righteousness. Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Everything that he had before as a Pharisee, everything that he had before as a sectarian person, everything that he had before as a religious Jew, all that he cast away, that he may win Christ. In verse 9, I may found in him, not having mine own righteousness. And be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He said, I threw away my own righteousness, my self-righteousness, my superficial righteousness, my sectarian righteousness. I threw away my supposed righteousness. I threw away all those right kinds of righteousness I was bragging in before. And now to win and to have and to receive the righteousness of God, which is by faith, by faith in Christ. Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see, the people that have not got the real righteousness, the true righteousness, the heavenly righteousness, they go about to publicize, to lift up, and to exalt their own righteousness. And it is because they are ignorant of the righteousness of God. Then it tells us now from verse 8. It says, but what says the scripture? What says it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith, which will preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's righteousness that will qualify us for heaven. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well then, if you, have, if you have God, just the other side of righteousness, the false righteousness, the counterfeit righteousness, the Lord is saying, throw that away. Don't brag about that because it's useless. Now come to the Lord and have this righteousness which is by faith in Christ. We're looking at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We're looking at verse 23 and verse 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth, verse 25, to be a propitiation through faith 
in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of the sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare his sin at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. All the Lord expects now is that we come to him and we believe on Christ. And as a result of believing in Christ, his righteousness is given unto us. And is given unto us as a gift. A look at Romans chapter 5 verse 17. For he by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. That's what we are now to receive. We give up the counterfeit righteousness and we get genuine righteousness from the Lord. That leads us to point number two. Praying for true righteousness. Praying for true righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 6. Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Uh, the question is, why do we study the Bible? It's to create thirst in us. To create hunger in us. It's like if uh, we all gather together. And you are not thinking of education at all. And then I begin to tell you. I say, see, it's not too late yet. There's somebody that I know. Uh, 35 years of age. He was a total illiterate. But he had a vision, he had a goal. He wanted to be somewhere in life. And then he knew without that education, he couldn't get to the place he wanted to get to. And in a few years, he went back to school. And he went, he did this and did this and did that. Now he's got the certificate he was asking for. And now he's in a very good place. As I begin to describe that to you, you begin to be desirous. You say, if he can do it at 35, I think I can do it. I'm just at three years of age. I said, what are we even talking about? There was a man. He was about 63 years of age. He had actually gone to school. And then he had qualified. But then he became dissatisfied and fed up with his uh, profession. And he wanted to go to another line. And other people were thinking, are you going to start afresh? He says, yes, I'll start. Because I do not have satisfaction in my profession. And at the age of 63, he chose a different line, a new discipline. And then he went to school. In a few years, he came back. Now he has a good certificate in the job he wants. And now he is uh, happily doing what he actually desires to do. And then I said, there was another person. He was, you know, he trained as a teacher. But he had always had a dream of being a pilot. And after being a teacher for many, many years, almost getting to the age of retirement, all of a sudden he said, am I going to die without fulfilling my dream of being a pilot? And at that age, even at the age of retirement as a teacher, he now went and he took all the courses he needed to take. Now he's happily settled in that profession of being a pilot. While I'm saying that, then you begin to also have a dream in your heart. Uh -uh. If it happened to somebody at 35, and the other fellow that retired as a teacher, and the other fellow that even went to school and got something but not satisfied, why should I stay in the same road? Why should I say my comfort zone and not make an effort? You see, what I'm telling you, what I'm testifying, what I'm teaching will, be, will birth hunger and thirst in your heart. The same thing with the Bible. As you come to study the word of God and then we say, look at this. All this kind of righteousness will not make it. The kind of righteousness that will make you to see the Lord is the righteousness of God that we get by faith. The reason we study is so that you will have hunger. And you will have thirst that this thing the Lord is talking about, I must get it. If you come to this study, there's no hunger in your heart. And then we go from verse to verse, from chapter to chapter, from one level to the other. And after going through all that, then there's no hunger, there's no thirst. It has not fulfilled its purpose. The reason for coming and for hearing all these things is that there will be hunger in your heart. I know you'll be hungry. 
and I know you'll be thirsty for this righteousness that qualifies us to be able to see the face of the Lord. And if the hunger is there, what's the next thing? Prayer. We pray for true righteousness. True righteousness. In Sephaniah chapter 2. Sephaniah. I'm reading to you from chapter 2. Sephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Sephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, or ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. It says we seek righteousness and we seek meekness so that we can be hidden in the day. We can be protected. We can be preserved in the day of his anger, of his indignation. When it says seek, what does that really translate to? Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 12 and 13. Then shall ye call upon me. And ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Do you see all the, all the verbs that are used there in verse 13? Seek me. In verse 13, search for me. In verse 12, call upon me. And then in still in verse, in verse 12, go and pray. And then it says, I'll act into you. They all mean the same thing. You seek, you search, you call, you pray unto the Lord. And for this righteousness, we have to pray. And it is when we pray that that righteousness will be given unto us. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Ask. And it shall be given you. Uh, now, when we come here, and the end of the time of prayer, we just, after the Bible study, we just go back home. And that will not be right. It's like, if you were really hungry, if you were really thirsty, and then I keep on describing to you that, well, you can get water today, and then I describe you go through that door and go to that place, you'll get the water that will satisfy your thirst. And then you're hungry and say, well, it's all available for you. Somebody has paid for it already. If you go that direction and go this direction, you're going to get all the food you need and everything has been paid for. After giving you all the description. And then, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty. Then you get up, and you go back home. Without following the direction, the place I told you to go, so you can get the water and get the food. Then you are not really hungry, you are not really thirsty. If you are hungry, if you are thirsty after righteousness, after the Bible study, you will not go back home. You will, you will show that you are thirsty and you are hungry, and you will pray. And then, if you are going to pray, come back to hunger and thirst. Let's say, for example, you are hungry, you are thirsty. If you are really hungry and really thirsty, and uh, maybe I was discussing something with you, and you didn't agree with that thing I was discussing with you, but you are hungry and thirsty, and it happens that I get up and I tell you, and I say, I see that you are hungry. You say, yes. I say, okay, let's leave all that thing we didn't agree with. Let's talk about your hunger and your thirst. If you go this way, you'll get the water. If you go this way, you'll get the food. And then you say, I'm not going to go to that place. Because this is the man that is telling me how to get the food. I don't like something. I need to settle that with him first. You are the one that will be hungry. You are not punishing the person that told you about the food, about the water. If you don't go there and get the water and the food, you are the one that will miss out on the food. You are the one that will miss out on the water. Therefore, you, we, don't, uh, we don't have anything to grind with a preacher. He's telling us, here is righteousness, the righteousness of God. And then you know there are some people, it's when they are happy with the preacher, that's when they pray after the message. When they are not happy with the preacher, I'm not happy today, I'm not going to pray, I'm going to go back home. In fact, the very reason, because he even said, pray. I'm going to show him, I'm not going to obey him, I'm not going to pray. We don't do that. If you are hungry, if you are thirsty, don't die of hunger, don't die of thirst. And you go to the Lord in prayer and say, God, I've seen it in your word. And because this is your word, I want the righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God by faith. And they will be able to get to heaven. 
uh, what if, uh, you know, it so happens that you are not born again and you ought to be born again. And uh, let's say when we were outside, I met you. It didn't happen. I'm just giving you a illustration in preaching. I said, why are you standing here? Why are you standing there? And then you get unhappy. You get frustrated. Go inside. Then you go inside. You come inside. And then I talk about salvation. And you are not saved yet. You are not born again yet. And then you are still thinking about, he told me to go in. He didn't give me the liberty I wanted. He didn't allow me to enjoy myself. The breeze outside. He said, I don't like him. I don't like what he's saying. He's telling me to get saved. Because he's the one telling me to get saved. I will not get saved. If you die. After the Bible study. If you die without that salvation, God will not say it's because you are unhappy with the preacher, you will go to hell. Therefore, when we come to the Bible study, you open your heart, you open your mind, you open your will. Because we need to get to heaven. And without this righteousness, we cannot make it. Therefore, be matured, be real men and real women and people that have a purpose of heart to say, I want to get to heaven by all costs. By all means. And the way to get to heaven is to have this righteousness, this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Therefore, you pray. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Uh, you know, uh, when you really understand what we are talking about, you'll be very, very careful, very, very careful how you disturb other people. Let's say somebody is dying of hunger, dying of thirst, and then we're trying to show him how to get the food. Maybe you have got the food already. You have got the water already. But he still needs that water of life. And he needs that bread of life. He has not got it. And while he's seeking and while he's searching, if you disturb him, if you hinder him, you might be the stumbling block that will not allow him to have the salvation of God that day or to have the righteousness the Lord wants to give him. And then you might say, well, I want to, let's say, for example, we're all standing. And, you know, the fellow is praying and praying and praying. Lord, give me this righteousness. I don't want to come to the Bible study in vain. I want to get to heaven by all costs. Lord, help me. I know my life. I know what I've been doing. All this thing that they are talking about, I've not been today, today. I want to be serious and get saved. I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. And you have finished your own prayer. And there's nothing wrong with you because you're finished, because you are saved already. You are a child of God already. Nothing wrong with you. You are finished, you want to go. And then he is, you know, he's praying and praying and praying, almost even perhaps crying. But he's standing in your way. And then if you begin to do something, whatever, so as to stop him, so you can have a place, a place to go. Now you tell me, the five minutes or the ten minutes you'll deny yourself and be patient for him and you will get saved and then will get to heaven. Or you don't want to deny yourself for the five minutes or the ten minutes of the way you feel, and then you push him out of the way, and then he doesn't not, then he, he opens his eye, ah, everybody is going, what's wrong with me? I'm the only one that is praying like this, and then he packs his Bible, and he goes, if he dies after that, without getting saved, just because you didn't want to be patient for five minutes, for ten minutes, to allow him to pray. This righteousness is so important, you want to help other people. You don't want to hinder other people from getting the righteousness. And a lot of other things that can happen to you. You are men, you are women, you are adult believers. You can think through. In what way can you sometimes hinder other people from getting this indispensable virtue of righteousness and godliness in their lives? In verse 8. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If we seek, we will find. And today we are going to find. It tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. We have read that before. But I hope we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And let's say, for example, you might be a worker. But something happened in your life 
your lost righteousness. It may be that you are in the office. And he is your boss. He is, he is an unbeliever. He hasn't anything to lose. If the boss gets angry, what has he got to lose? A sinner is a sinner. If he even slaps you, what has he got to lose? He's still a sinner. He was a sinner before slapping you. He's still a sinner when he slapped you. He will still continue to be a sinner after he has slapped you. You see, a believer is very careful. With the unbelievers, though some believers have nothing to lose. They're already down. They're already on the ground. They're already unsaved. They're sinners. But you have righteousness. You have the grace of God. And you have the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And just before you came out of the office, maybe a Monday night, is when the boss said, hey, come here. I've told this uh, man, he shouldn't be talking to me as if I'm still a primary school child. See the way he has called me. All right, I'll show him today. But remember, you have something to lose or something to gain. And then he said, didn't you hear I was calling you? And then he begins to abuse you and to insult you. And now you say you're educated. You say you're a secretary. You say you're this. You say you're that. Then the temptation is coming. If I don't reply this man today, he'll think that he's clever. Because it's one day you will have to, you know, show him and cut him to his size. Because of the way he's talking to me. You have something to gain or something to lose. And then you give way to anger. You give way to bitterness. And then you talk rough and everything. You to take your job, take your job. I'm not even interested anymore. If you see me here anymore, anytime, anytime you know that maybe I'm, I'm, I'm really looking for money. Take your job. And then after you left that place, you, you are all guilty, condemned. And you know that you have lost something. But maybe you are a worker. And then you come to the Bible study. And the Lord is saying, go and seek the Lord. Now that is fresh on your mind. Now that you know that you have lost something and you are not in the right state of mind, you say, no, I must go and do my work. Work. But work will not take us to heaven. It's righteousness. Seek and you'll find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. And without that, we rush into ministry. We rush into work, Christian work. And then by the time you finish, the guilt, the condemnation, the burden that was on your heart at that time is no more there. Therefore, you just, just gloss over it and uh, just say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. <laughs> and you're finished. And then after that again, second day, that thing is going to become a habit. That another person talks to you again. Because you did that yesterday, the habit will be building up. You become an angry man, an angry woman. And you live your life exactly like that. And then, until Christ will come, you continue in ministry. You continue walking. But you've lost the real righteousness. Why wouldn't you be wise? And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then after that, all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these shall be added unto you. We're looking at uh, Osea chapter 10. In Osea chapter 10, we're looking at verse 12. Osea chapter 10, verse 12. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. The Lord will do it. And it will be a privilege to be righteous and holy in the sight of the Lord in Jesus' name. I come to point number three. Possessors of true righteousness. Possessors of true righteousness. Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 6. Matthew 5 verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at righteousness. For they shall be filled. They shall be filled. The time comes in our lives that we become filled with righteousness. And we know it. The Spirit of God bears witness with our heart that now we have been filled with righteousness. The question is, have there been people before us that we can point to who are possessors of righteousness? Yes, there have been people. Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, reading from verse 14 and verse 20. Ezekiel 14, verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, 
They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord. The Lord pointed out these people that they were righteous and that they would deliver their souls by their righteousness. Verse 20, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in age, as I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their own righteousness. I'm sure you understand when the Lord said, these men that were righteous, they could only deliver themselves by their righteousness. It's like when daddy is hungry and the child, the son is hungry. Or mommy is hungry and the daughter is hungry. And then daddy or mommy they will go to the table and eat. The eating of the father and the satisfaction of the hunger of the father does not satisfy the son. And the quenching of the thirst of the mother does not quench the thirst of the daughter. Everyone has to eat by himself. Everyone has to drink by himself. That's what we are being told here. That the righteousness Noah possessed was just for Noah. And the righteousness of Job was just for Job. The righteousness of Daniel was just for Daniel. If their relatives were going to be righteous, they will go to the same fountain of the bread of life, of the water of life, and take for themselves. But the point is, these were righteous, and we can be righteous, and we will be righteous. In Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 5, Luke 1 verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah, of the cause of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments, in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, and they had no child because that elizabeth was barren and they both were now streaking well streaking in years i added verse 7 for you to know that a person is barren does not mean that she cannot be righteous that a man has not been able to have a child with a wife does not mean she'll throw away righteousness which is what some people do today you, you ask them, it looks like the way you are living now and the way you are walking zigzag, you go there, you go there, you go everywhere and are looking for child. It looks like you are not consistent anymore. In fact, the way you behave and the way you act now, it, it looks like no, there's no righteousness anymore. Oh, it says, yes, you are right. R righteousness. What am I going to do with righteousness now? Say, I don't have any child. And people are looking at me saying, you are going to church, you are going to deeper life, you are reading the Bible, and you are praying, and you are doing everything. You say you are a worker, you are serving the Lord, and there is no charge. Uh, that's why I'm trying to solve my problem. That's why I go to all those places. Oh yes, I know that things have changed in my life. I know that I'm not living right anymore, but I'm looking for charge. But you see, if you allow children to hinder you from getting to the kingdom of God, how wise are you? And look at Zechariah here. Look at Elizabeth. Leave child childbearing in the hands of God. I don't have a child. Leave that in the hands of God. I don't have a job. Leave that in the hands of God. I don't have anybody to get married to yet. Leave that in the hands of God and be righteous. Is it everybody that gets married that gets to heaven? Is it everyone that has child that gets to heaven? Is it everyone that has husband that has wife that gets to heaven? The number one thing is the righteousness that gets us to heaven. And then eventually now in this same chapter, the angel was sent to him. And the angel now announced, God has answered your prayer. What if he quit? What if he abandoned righteousness? What if he said, since I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't want righteousness anymore, the child will not come. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it says, all these things shall be added unto you. Well, we're studying this not just because of Zechariah. We're studying it not just because of Paul the Apostle. We're studying it for ourselves. My question then is, if we are possessors of righteousness, true righteousness, how would you know? 
that this brother is a possessor of righteousness. This sister is a possessor of righteousness. It's uh, revealed to us in that word, righteous. And you look at the spelling of that word, the word righteous. And the righteous are, receives the gift of righteousness. Receives. Are there means he receives the gift of righteousness. Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 17. For he by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and they receive of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. How do you know somebody who, has, who is righteous? He receives righteousness and he reigns in life in righteousness. He reigns over temptation. He reigns over trials. He reigns over tragedy. He reigns over all the troubles of life. The troubles of life, they don't reign over him. He has received the gift of righteousness. And by the receiving of the gift of righteousness, he reigns in all circumstances of life. And you don't find him doing any unrighteous thing because of a problem that showed up. That's a person who is righteous. I, he inherits true righteousness by faith. He inherits true righteousness by faith faith. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. And I'm reading from verse 7. Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Heir of the righteousness which is by faith. He inherited the righteousness which is by faith. You go to God. You have a relationship with God. A father-child relationship. And then you have the inheritance of righteousness by faith from the Lord. Righteousness. I receive. I inherit. G. He guides all his affairs with discretion. He guides all his affairs with discretion. You see, a righteous man does not just act anyhow. He acts in a guided way. He acts in a directed manner. He acts in a controlled manner. He guides his affairs. All his affairs. What are the affairs in the family? Affairs in the place of work, affairs among his friends, affairs in his village, in taking decision, a righteous one, if we have received righteousness, if we have inherited righteousness, you will guide the affairs of your life with discretion. Psalm 112, 112. Psalm 112, I'm reading from verse 3. In Psalm 112, verse 3. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright, that's the righteous, there rises light in darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. He doesn't just, you know, jump anywhere, go anywhere, fall into something, get into agreement, put his hand in something. He guides his affairs with discretion, with godly wisdom. That's a righteous man. You see a person that just behaves anyhow, rough, unthinking, unwise, not regulated, not directed by the word of God. That's not righteousness. When you speak, when you act, when you go, the way you live, you guide the affairs of your life with wisdom and direction. H, the righteous hates sin and loves righteousness. He hates sin and loves righteousness. That's how you know a righteous man, a righteous one. We're told in Psalm 45, Psalm 45, verse 7. Psalm 45, verse 7. Though thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness, 
Therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, you hate sin. Now, let's say, for example, somebody committed sin, but to help you. Somebody committed sin, so as to get you something. And he says, I, I know that I know you are a deeper life. And you will not, I know you will not do this. You will not act like this. But you know, we love you. We appreciate you. And you're missing something. If you don't talk to these people of the world like this, you'll not get your right. Anyway, you'll not do it. We know. We'll do it for you. And then they go to either fight or they go to steal or they go to do something to protect you, to provide something for you. If you are a righteous person, you're not going to accept that. You will hate sin and you will love righteousness. Or if, let's say, for example, somebody is trying to cheat you in the accommodation, in the place you are, trying to, you are living, and then the people see how you, you know, just go there, you, if you put your thing in the bathroom, or you put your bucket of water there, or you're doing whatever it is, you know, they come because they know you are not going to talk, because you, you prize heaven more than any other thing. And they can cheat you if they want to cheat, and they know, they know that you will not talk, you cannot talk. Then somebody gets concerned, and he says, what? Why are you treating this young man like this? Why are you treating this woman like this? Because she will not talk. All right, we'll, we'll do it for you. And then when somebody, then you, they wanted to do the things that they used to do against you. And then this other fellow comes and slaps them. Don't do that again. Don't you know that because he's gentle and because you know that he will not talk, then inside your heart, you are happy. That's uh -huh. Somebody will show them. Thank God. God will, God will raise up a defender. <laughs> God, you, you think is God raising up somebody to go to hell on your behalf? If you are righteous, you will hate sin. You say, please, don't do that for me. Don't do that on my behalf. I will not do it because I want to go to heaven. And I will not want any other person to do it on my behalf. Because I want the people that love me to also get to heaven. But you see the kind of righteousness some people say they have. They may not do the evil themselves, but if there is a backslider that is willing to do the evil, if there is a sinner that is willing to do the evil, then they rejoice internally. That's no salvation. If somebody is doing the evil to defend you, to promote you, to give you something, say, no, don't do it on my behalf. I want to get to heaven. I want you to get to heaven too. Because a righteous person, H, hates sin and loves righteousness, T, turns others to righteousness that's a righteous person he turns others to righteousness in daniel chapter 12 verse 3 daniel chapter 12 verse 3 and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever if you are truly a righteous person, the influence of your life, the impact of your life will be to turn other people to righteousness. You'll be witnessing to them. You'll be winning their souls to righteousness. You'll be telling them, that's the way of perdition. That's the way of destruction. You will not spend a day with a sinner and just talk, talk, talk business, talk every other thing, and never talk about salvation. You'll be turning many to righteousness. And then, of course, here we are. And we have we are members of the church together. And you see that one of the members of the church is not behaving in an irrational manner. And then you, maybe the coordinator is not able to get at her, or the zona leaders are not able to get at her, or the women reps. And then, but you are members together. If you are really righteous, you get near that individual. You say, uh, my friend, it looks like uh, nowadays you behave in some irrational ways. And you are becoming like a radical. And it looks like uh, you are not the kind of person you used to be. And then he says, yes, I have to. You know, you, you know, sometimes if you don't put up a strong front before all these people, even though it is church, even though we are here together as church, I've discovered in our district, especially those people in the marriage committee, when I'm going to go to them, if I know I'm going in two weeks' time, and then, you know, and I know them, 
and I deliberately make myself strong and have a bold face and have thick skin. Because if I don't do that, when I get to them in two weeks' time, they'll be asking me all sorts of questions. But I have to do like that so that they'll not ask me a foolish question. They will not hinder me in the way I want to go. Now, that's the way. Some people are like that. But you as a Christian friend, you are the one to say, sit down here. Do you want to say because of that you want to perish and go to hell? The Lord is not like that. He said, learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest for your soul. You turn them from a righteousness unto righteousness. If you have a friend, if you have a neighbor, if you have a wife, you, you see your wife, uh, maybe she doesn't want to come to Sunday worship. Or she doesn't want to come to uh, this. You know, you don't say, I'm leaving home like somebody I saw the other week and said, uh, you know, because she was uh, getting late and um, serious and all that. So I went to church and saw the wife then ran, went to another church. And then when they both saw me together, uh, the woman said, this is how my husband is uh, doing at home. And because uh, she feels if it's me, I'm not fast enough, I'm not doing this enough. And I asked, the, I said, my brother, is it, is it true? Oh, he says, yes, because I'm a worker. I don't want to miss the work of God. And I just say, you take care of yourself. You don't want to come, that's your business. And then I went to church. You went to church and you have a car. You brought the car to the church with, by yourself. And then your wife is still back at home and then went to another church. And that doesn't concern you. You will turn your wife unto righteousness. You plead with your husband and turn your husband to righteousness. A righteous person turns others to righteousness. You have a good impact, influence on other people to turn them to the way of righteousness. He, he exceeds religious people in righteousness. A righteous man exceeds religious people in righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. O a righteous one obeys God from the heart. You are righteous. You will be obeying God, not superficially. You obey God, not when it is convenient. You obey God, not when you are happy. You obey God every time from the heart. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servant to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death, of obedience unto righteousness. Obedience unto righteousness. You cannot have obedience, you cannot have righteousness without obedience. But God be sang that ye were the servants of sin, and ye have obeyed from the heart that doctrine, that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You, the righteous, understands the fear of God in righteousness. The righteous understands the fear of God in righteousness. You see, the way some people act in life is that it's almost that there's no God. They go to church almost like the, the God of the Bible is not going to follow the Bible. They come to church, but it's almost like they really don't have the fear of God. But you see, the righteous understands the fear of God in righteousness. Proverbs chapter 2. In Proverbs chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shall thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good purse. And then S, the righteous sows the seed of righteousness everywhere 
every day. The righteous sows the seed of righteousness everywhere, every day. In James chapter 3, James chapter 3, verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, we're reading from verse 30. Psalm 37, verse 30. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Proverbs 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. As you come to possess the righteousness of the Lord, you receive the gift of righteousness. You, you inherit true righteousness. You guide all your affairs with discretion. You hate sin. You love righteousness. You turn others to righteousness. Your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of religious people. You obey God from the heart. You understand the fear of God and righteousness. And every day and every time, you're sowing the seed of righteousness in the hearts of people. If these are the possessors of righteousness, in all sincerity, can you say that you are righteous? And can you say, should the rapture happen tonight, that you are righteous enough to be of the Lord? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's give the Lord chance to fill us with righteousness tonight. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord himself, in his goodness, in his grace, according to his promise, will fill us with righteousness. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. The study is to make us hungry, to make us thirsty of this righteousness that will help us to be able to see the Lord on the final day. Don't hinder other people from being righteous. Help them. Assist them. Encourage them. Influence them to be righteous. Then the Lord will bless you. Because you are righteous. And you are helping others also to be righteous. It's the righteousness of faith. It's not of works. We receive it as a gift from the Lord. We inherit it, the inheritance of righteousness by faith. And then that righteousness will guide us, make us to guide our lives with discretion and wisdom. That righteousness will guide our tongue, will guide our eyes, will guide our ears, what we hear, what we read, what we see, what we say, will guide us in all our fears of life will guide us in our relationship with our wives, our relationship with our husband, our relationship with our children and parents. That righteousness will guide us, all the affairs of our lives, with discretion. The righteousness will guide what we we'll watch. The magazines we we'll read will guide us. In the places we go, will guide us. In the friends we keep, will guide us in the actions of our lives. We guide all the affairs of our lives with discretion because we're righteous. The righteousness makes us to hate sin and to love righteousness. You don't want a sinner to sin on your behalf. You don't want a backslider to sin on your behalf. You don't want to reap any advantage from anybody's sin. You don't want people to lose their lives because they are protecting you. Because they are defending you. Because they know you cannot fight for your right. They want to fight for your right on your behalf and lose their soul. You don't want that. 
you hate sin, you love righteousness. And you turn many unto righteousness. That's, those are the possessors of righteousness. Your life is turning people away from sin unto righteousness. Your preaching is turning people away from unrighteousness unto righteousness. Your influence is turning many unto righteousness. Your lifestyle will turn your wife unto righteousness. You'll not allow your wife, you'll not allow your husband to retain bitterness in their heart. And you will not tell any story to your wife that will poison her mind, that will make her bitter about your business partner, about so and so. You don't want to ruin the life of your wife. On the other hand, you want to turn your wife unto righteousness. You want to turn your husband unto righteousness. You want to possess, you want to preserve, you want to practice the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. I want to obey the word of God from the heart. The righteous understands the fear of God in righteousness. And the righteous will keep on sowing the seed of righteousness in every heart, everywhere, every day.